So good morning, everyone, once again. So the, the topic that I was given was case study of container services. So I have covered this uh, topic as well, but I saw that uh, your uh, this week's training is about uh, pricing. So covered few slides on pricing because it is a little different from what uh, railway does. Although the participants here are uh, junior in the sense that uh, in divisions, uh, or even in headquarters, uh, rating and pricing is not in our purview. <clears throat> uh, in fact, uh, uh, having worked for as senior DOM and senior DCM also, uh, I personally did not have any idea how the railway board uh, does rating and pricing because it is a specialized subject. Uh, so therefore, uh, I'll be covering that aspect also. Concord pricing is a little different uh, from what uh, railway does. In two ways, one is concord pricing is rating is uh, very, very flexible. Uh, it's not uh, uh, too heavily centralized as it is in uh, railways. And uh, uh, there are a lot of schemes in pricing. So that gives us marketing edge over the competitors. So people should know that uh, the container ships today transport more than 60% of the value of goods shipped via sea. So when we talk of container business, the vessels uh, are the mainstay as far as their transportation from one country to another is concerned. Globally, 75% of break bulk cargo, that is loose cargo, is being shipped, that is being shipped is containerized. Whereas in our country, it is just 50%. That means there is tremendous scope of a lot of cargo, which is yet to be containerized. So container business in our country is a sunrise industry. It's on a growth path. Our ports uh, by next year will be having the capacity of handling 47 million TEUs. Uh, T is nothing but a unit of measurement of container, 20 feet equivalent unit. In 1819, we, and India handled almost 15 million TUs. 1920, official figures are not out, and therefore it would not be proper for me to quote a figure, but it will be definitely more than this. As far as Indian logistics industry is concerned, it is valued at 160 billion US dollars. And uh, by next year, it will be 215 million US dollars. And uh, in fact, global pandemic uh, has not affected uh, containerized business much. In fact, there is a spurt uh, of growth in container business. There is an index called the Logistics Performance Index, and uh, uh, India is fairly placed. But we all can see that we are. Uh, at 44th rank. Globally, uh, this industry employs 40 million people, and in India alone, half of the population is employed in the logistics sector. The logistics industry is growing at a uh, CAGR of almost 8%, and further growth, as I told you, it will be more than uh, 10 to 15%. That is the kind of growth. So if anyone is planning his or her career in the field of logistics industry, and especially container business, this is the right opportunity to do so. Our GDP is around two trillion US dollars, and uh, post pandemic, it has again shown the path of growth. If you see the port throughput, which I just quoted, fourteen point six eight. Uh, as far as global volume is concerned, it is just one point, it's less than 2%. So again, it uh, reinforces my idea uh, and uh, assumption that the logistics industry in general and container business in particular is a sunrise industry in this country and is having a tremendous potential of growth. This is just an overview of Navasheva port. Those who have visited, uh, for them, it's not a new thing, but those who have not visited, 
my sincere advice would be to visit at least one of the ports, either Jain port or Mundra uh, port, just to uh, have an idea how containers are handled. Officially, in 1922, <clears throat> there are 12 major ports in our country. They handle 705 million tons of cargo. Uh, as compared to 1819, there was a growth. <clears throat> so if you see how this growth was driven, driven by high handling of containers, coal and fertilizer. Containers used not to figure in the total cargo handled at ports, but today you can see that they are a major chunk in the overall uh, uh, tonnage throughput of any port. In terms of TEUs, the total number of containers handled, that also you can see that there is a marginal growth, obviously, because of the pandemic, but it's, it's still it is growing. And uh, uh, as I gave the first slide, that the even major ports of our country uh, handle about 60% of total cargo. So it's a not only a global phenomena, in India also, ports are handling that kind of container cargo. <clears throat> Just to give an overview, the number of vessels handled by ports was around 20,837. And the vessel traffic declined nearly less than 1%, but you just saw that the tonnage and throughput grew. <clears throat> the, the vessel uh, traffic in first quarter of uh, 1920 had declined because of the onset of pandemic. But uh, surprisingly, the, this cargo is again back to its original track. In fact, the trade between China and USA is the highest in uh, 2021, and the same trend continues in 21-22, April to August. We are growing at a humble CAGR of 7%, and this is the last five years. So this is uh, a very conservative uh, growth, but the projected growth is uh, more than 10.5%. By 2024, so just three years hence, India would be handling around 33 million TUs per annum. Container Corporation handled 3.82 million TUs in 1919 and 3.75 million TUs in 1920 because of the last quarter and quarter being bad due to pandemic. This deliberately I have kept, because, but I will uh, rush through because I thought that if uh, there are very junior officers, I would like to educate them a little bit about containers also. So container is nothing but a, uh, a large size, standardized size, a resealable transport metal box. There are two kinds, 20 feet and 40 feet. So therefore, 20 feet container is referred as 20 feet equivalent, and it is a standard measurement globally. Everywhere in the world, so the container throughput is measured in terms of number of TUs. The 40 feet equivalent will be uh, equal to two TUs. So if you load one FEU, your loading will tell you that you have loaded two TUs. All shipping containers globally follow the ISO International Standards Organization standard, and countries generally tend, even for domestic movement, they tend to follow ISO. But certain countries have different size of domestic containers for their inland movement. So there are the domestic standard sizes. Uh, in India, in 1981, first ISO container moved. So we are, it's quite a recent phenomenon. Uh, from the first ICD of Bangalore, Indian Railway have uh, given its big shed, which was developed as ICD. Everyone must have seen uh, some container on the road trailer or on a train or on a vessel. This is a general purpose container. Anything, any, let us call it dry container, anything can be loaded inside. Uh, this is a flat rack container. Both the ends are collapsible, generally for heavy machinery, vehicles on track, big wheels, uh, the whole dimensional consignments, and this tall flat rack. This is an open top container, again, uh, suitable uh, for overheight uh, dimension cargo. Uh, 
uh, and at the same time, an end door is also provided. <clears throat> These are the most popular containers called double door containers or tunnel containers uh, or end open containers. High cube container is as good as a general purpose or a dry container, but it's higher by one feet. It's almost nine feet high. Otherwise, in containers are <clears throat> sorry, it's nine and a half feet. Otherwise, containers are eight and a half feet. These are called high cube containers for loading more. Then open side containers. You can see they are also called side access. Uh, there are many uh, customers who prefer to load on the rake itself. That's called chassis loading. Uh, so they load through side access doors and then shut it on the chassis itself. This is a reefer container in which we move fruits, vegetables, uh, and a lot of uh, uh, frozen meat. And it's very popular. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, from Dadri terminal and Kanpur terminal, uh, almost four, uh, two and a half trains uh, to Mundra, one train to JNPT and half train to Pipao, meat is loaded every day. It's every day traffic. That is the kind of one. This is insulated container. It's similar to a uh, reefer container uh, and uh, pharmaceutical products are loaded. This also has um, a, the charging facility, just like reefer container, and en route you know, power packs provide electricity. So you can see blood, um, human organs, food, pharmaceutical products, biological materials, sensitive chemicals, to move things. Tank containers also you must have seen a uh, lot of uh, <clears throat> other than your BTPM wagons or OT wagons. Now these tank containers are also moved to container trains on flat and a lot of edible oil movement, ethyl alcohol movement, a uh, lot of hazardous chemicals move through tank containers. Now coming to services, what are the logistic services that any container terminal that are provided? First is of course train handling, then container storage, then at any exam terminal which he handles the export and import cargo, there has to be a customs facilitation to big uh, customs uh, uh, office with the uh, custom bonded area. Then we also provide warehousing, all kinds of warehousing, so transit warehousing, bonded warehousing and less than container load warehousing for aggregation of cargo is also provided. Any kind of associated value added services. Value added services could be in the form of palletization, packing, labeling, marking, uh, assortment, marketing, providing e-services, anything that adds value to the product. Then door-to-door -door solution means uh, first mile and last mile connectivity. And now most of the container terminals are also uh, qualified as PFTs, private freight terminal, that means the private good ships, where even railway uh, wagons can be handled, like say ACM, BRM, etc., or also handled in the container sidings. It's an additional source of income. How a container moves, most of us in railways are actually not aware. So I thought just to give an idea, you can see that from sea vessel a container ship has arrived. At seaport it is berged. From seaport the containers are loaded on the chain. From train, it reaches to the dry port, that is the inland container depot in the hinterland. And from there, through first mile, last mile connectivity, the container is supplied to the factory. In the reverse direction also, it is the same. So many people confuse what a dry port is. Dry port is nothing but a container terminal in the hinterland. Now what happens at, at the top? You can see unloading from train through the gantry cranes, putting it on the trailer, uh, and then unloading from trailer, putting it in the custom bonded area where custom examination takes place by custom inspectors. When it is released, then it is out of gate uh, for the factory premises of the custom. These all activities provide earning to the organization that is confirmed. You can see the warehouse operation. This is a reach truck putting uh, the pallets uh, in the stack area, multiple stacking area. Uh, if you want to see this operation, you can visit Tublakabad depot 
it's a beautifully operated uh, uh, terminal. Uh, many of us do not even know how containers are handled. So I thought I'll just give an overview. So this is a rail mounted gantry you can see. If you come to Tughlaqabad, you'll find that on the four lines where trains are handled, there is a rail mounted gantry. So it will pick up a container on rail. Whereas the red diagram shows rubber tire gantry. It moves on road. The full gantry moves on road and picks up containers uh, the way one container is being handled right now. I'll show you some more pictures for better appreciation. Then the yellow one is a reach stacker, right? which handles the container, lifts the container on terminal and puts it on the rail or puts it into the warehouse. <clears throat> the orange one is a forklift. Uh, most of you must have seen at airports. This is a reach truck mainly for warehouses, the orange one. And the last one is a filling crane. You must have seen on highways, expressways, picking up the uh, vehicles, damaged vehicles, accidental vehicles. In Concord, we generally don't use link cranes. We use modern cranes that I just showed to you. RMGs, RTGs, reach stackers, reach trucks, etc. You must have heard of word multimodal transport. Today, when you go back after this lecture, you should be more educated with these terminologies. Multimodal is nothing, but you can see so many pictures that there is a train, there is a plane, there is a, uh, a road trailer, and behind, it, if you focus, you can see a ship also. So multimodal is nothing but transporting a cargo through more than one mode of transport. Interestingly, you will see globally, all roads lead to China, but roads lead in India. You can see the percentage of uh, uh, cargo being moved by different modes. And you see a good phenomena that in the US, railways carry only 48% of uh, uh, overall cargo, whereas roads are 37% only. Waterways, 14%. If you see China, the figure is still startling. Waterways is 30%. Railways, just 47%. And road, 22%. If you see India, roads are 57%. Rail share is 36%. Waterway is negligible 6%. Uh, air, of course, everywhere it is just 1% because it's very, very expensive to, uh, to send a cargo by air. <coughs> so only most urgent and most expensive like gems in jail, etc. People generally use otherwise. So what, what will be good for our country is that we shift more from road to rail, not because I'm a railway man, but because it is good for a country and we should develop more of waterways in our country. A huge country with so many uh, waterways, still connectivity is so poor. So now this present government is focusing more on developing waterways and less dependence on road. Despite uh, developing so many expressways, the idea is to have a, a more robust network of railways and dedicated freight corridor and develop uh, the inland waterways. Uh, quickly, I'll get to the railways carry 36%. You are one of the largest network globally. You carry more than 1 billion million tons of cargo every year through rail. In fact, 60% of your rail traffic is carried on only 16% of rail route kilometer. That is golden quadrilateral. So what is required is that we switch more on uh, uh, waterways and rail to make it environment friendly transportation rather than depending more on road. <laughs> Roads carry 57 to 60%. Majority of freight traffic is again carried only on 12% of road. So therefore you find that there is a need to develop more number of uh, roadways and expressways. <clears throat> but yes, now modern trailers, uh, 12 uh, wheel trailers, 16 wheel trailers are on the road. Uh, uh, close body trucks are on the road. They, they also carry a specialized cargo. So, I mean, in a way, it is good that uh, the dependence on rail for the trade has reduced, but at the same time, there is a heavy cost. So, if you if you transport it through sea route and rail route, the carbon footprints uh, uh, you save. Maritime, uh, you can see that that is the major. Uh, source of movement of 
any kind of carbon, and especially container carbon. Inland waterway, as I told you, India has recognized 106 waterways, out of which six are declared as national waterways. So national waterway number one, two, three, four, five, and six. National waterway one is uh, uh, from uh, Varanasi to Haldia, rather Mirzapur to Haldia, which on this route, yes, some cargo has started moving. Some of you must have seen the news of you know, Maruti cars being carried through inland waterway number one. But yes, we are still far, uh, far behind. Total navigable length of waterway is 14,500 kilometers and 5,200 kilometers of river and 4,000 kilometers of canals. So there's a tremendous potential. And yes, this country has to develop the inland waterway or the coastal way. Now, why I have emphasized that uh, this particular two diagrams that I'm going to, two slides that I'm going to share, we just see uh, that uh, which is the cheapest mode. So if you transport something by road, it is 2.28 rupees you know, per ton per kilometer. By rail, it is 1.41 rupees per ton per kilometer. And by water weight, it is just 1.19 rupees per ton per kilometer because simply of the economy, a reason for economy of scale. If you see the fuel consumption, the most green method would be inland waterways. So 24 tons, uh, one liter of fuel can move 24 tons by road, 85 tons by rail, and 105 tons by water. So obviously, economy scale works here also. So the overall vision of the Ministry of Commerce today is to reduce the logistics cost per unit, which we, we are very high globally. We are not all that competitive. Almost 14 to 16 percent of GDP is our uh, uh, logistics cost, and we have to reduce it to seven to eight percent because all developed nations, their logistic cost is much lower. Coastal shipping, uh, you must be wondering that uh, containers move through coastal shipping only. This coastal shipping is called domestic movement. And uh, uh, you will realize that uh, today your ports account for 90 percent of international trade. But in country, only 7% of domestic freight is moving through coastal shipping. What I mean will be clear by the next diagram. See, you have a beautiful coastline. India is blessed with a, such a lovely coastline uh, on the uh, western side uh, from Kandla you know, up to southern Tutikurin and similarly from eastern side Haldia to Tutikurin. Such a vast coastal land. So why a domestic cargo should not move in bulk with 700 containers, 750 containers in a ship, rather than moving by rail or road? Uh, so yes, Concord uh, does coastal shipping and moves domestic containers, uh, aggregates at Tangla and moves domestic containers to Mangalore, Kochi, and Tuticorin. Similarly, on the eastern side, now Haldia, Paradeep ports are well developed port, Krishna Patnam port is already developed, Katupalli near Chennai is already developed, and then Tutikulam. So this is the future of domestic container movement in our country, and rightly so. Here, as I told you, that uh, it's a negligible percentage of 1%. First mile, last mile connectivity, if I talk, uh, uh, it used to be uh, a theoretical concept. Today, Container Corporation does almost 1.25 lakh TUs per annum through first mile, last mile. That means that is another business share. Today, what happens at our good sheds? A, con a, a train arrives at good shed. Uh, some contractor unloads it, takes it uh, on his trucks to the nearest warehouse. Uh, we don't uh, permit that. We not only bring our train, we also provide our trailers. We also provide warehouse. So every pound of flesh uh, belongs to us. So that is the kind of earning one can realize by uh, doing first mile and last mile connectivity by providing the road services. So it's again very, very profitable business today. Then with the help of Indian Railways now, Timetable trains are running. Today, 17 pair of timetable trains are running, giving a short transit to the customers. Say from Dadri to Mundra, we are making a train reaching 60 hours. It used to take 100 hours. This is saving of 40 hours. 
Similarly, Dadri to Nova Sheva port in 38 hours. That means one and a half day only. Uh, with the DFC coming, the time will further reduce. Because today's trade wants a guaranteed a short term. Similarly, double stack trains. Uh, double stack trains, we are running almost 250 double stack trains per day. Double stack has two fold advantages. Operationally, you can dispatch 180 containers on a uh, train at a time. And commercially, on the upper deck, we charge less from the customers, almost 50%. Then, Concord has also started services offshore to Nepal. So from Kolkata to uh, Birganj, from Vizag to uh, uh, Birganj. These two services uh, we are providing. You can see uh, 1,14,000 containers were moved in 1920. 2021 figures are still not passed to AGM. That will I'm not sharing. But this is the kind of business. So uh, is being done. Same thing is true with the Bangladesh also. From Kolkata to uh, Benapol. Benapol is a station in Bangladesh. Uh, that uh, services we are giving. Uh, six to eight trains per month are being moved to Bangladesh. We can, in fact, there is a potential to move 30 trains per month. That means one train per day. But because of congestion in Bangladesh, they are not able to accept. So Railway Board has defined a quota of eight trains per month to Bangladesh. If we talk of dedicated freight corridor, it will be very, very appropriate for this particular batch because you can see the uh, both the dedicated freight corridors being shown here. The eastern corridor is from Dankuni to Ludhiana, and the western is from uh, Ludhiana to Navashiva Port, <coughs> connecting. Uh, so what Kanpur has done as a part of strategy that on both the alignment, it has developed a lot of container traffic. Any, any progressive business organization would like to do that and invest a lot of money uh, because dedicated fleet corridor operations has begun and we are dispatching, there is a terminal called Khatwas near Rivadi. We are dispatching uh, average 12 trains each way per day on dedicated fleet corridor for Mundra and power ports. And, and by the end of <coughs> this financial year, that is by March 2022, it is expected that even Nava Shiva port will be connected. So you can imagine the kind of volume that will move. And now, presently on dedicated freight corridor, single trains are moving, but in future there will be uh, uh, 1,500 meter trains uh, with 360 containers uh, moving at one go. That is the kind of volume that will ride on BFC. So you know there are uh, six DFCs, out of which two DFCs are likely to be completed soon. One is Amritsar to Dhanpuri, another is JNP to Dadri. And uh, <clears throat> now container terminals are being set. Needless to say that uh, on the next slide I can show you that on DFC, 25 ton axle loads uh, will work. One container train will carry 360 TUs. By December 2021, there is a likely completion date, although it might spill over to March 22. Uh, but 130 trains per day per direction is the kind of volume that will move when DFC is fully functional. And it will translate into 65 million TUs per hour. You must have heard the word multimodal logistic power. So what is a multimodal logistic power? Any power, any logistic power which can operate in more than one mode of transport, so at least rail and road. So it should have multimodal access. It should have access to Indian railway freight lines. Uh, there, there is an ICD dry port inside. There is a domestic container terminal inside. There are, there are various kinds of warehouses available in the MMLP. Uh, then this is a place where cargo aggregation and distribution takes place. Uh, then all modern rig stackers, rubber tire gantries, RNGs, uh, advanced cranes are available for handling of cargo, fully paved area. I'll show you some pictures, customized and modern warehousing. So customized IP application uh, is provided. In fact, uh, if, if ever you get a chance, please visit Atwas Multimodal Logistic Park. 
Today, Container Corporation has 17 MMLPs already commissioned, and uh, five, six more are likely to be uh, functional by 2022. So these are the services that are provided. And why is it so? Because today's customer wants a single window solution. You can, you can imagine the, the extent, well, some 300 acres, 200 acres, logistics parks are there. This is a Katwa's rail operational lines, <clears throat> rail side operations, a crane handling containers, on the trailer, uh, a specialized cargo auto car for ATL Vasco is being handled at the same terminal, modern warehouses, you can see neat and clean stacks. The entire Lloyd AC, they have taken over one of the you know, full warehouses. The Pickles Bay Bridge. Trailer parking area, almost 40,000 square meter of trailer parking. Where else they will park? You can see in the background, Hindustan Factory of Hindustan Zinc Limited, our captive customer. Then how a rail side operation takes place. The trailers carrying the, the shipping line containers. A double stack train at Khatwas is being formed. One of you can see that it is in the last stages of formation. And just to show a difference between a single stack and a double stack. These are the advantages of a double stack train. This is our train. Economy of scale, of course, more containers in one train, reduction in dwell time faster in bulk evacuation, reduce carbon footprint, and of course, commercial benefit to the customer because we are providing concessional rate for upper deck containers, which are lightweight containers. So a lot of road containers have shifted to rail now because we are providing tariff uh, almost equal to road or little less than road. This is a futuristic, it's, it's, a, it's a picture from a foreign railway. Because your DFC is also going to be electrified, so this is how it will uh, look like. I mean, this is how it will have electrified operations on DFC in future. It's a new concept called ILMZ, Integrated Logistics and Manufacturing Zone. Meaning thereby, today what is happening? Uh, the the tray opens a terminal and then spends a lot of money on first mile, last mile, then rail connectivity. So now the government is thinking that we should develop integrated manufacturing zone and provide logistic services at their doorstep to reduce logistic costs. So government of Andhra Pradesh gave us a land at Muchli Patnam, where we are developing a uh, full-fledged ILMZ in 1,000 acres of land. And these activities, all kinds of industries, agri-processing, automobile, for you name an industry, will be available and from there we'll be doing all the logistics services, right? Whatever services I told you, so container handling, customs, cargo aggregation, value services, customer IT application, warehousing, etc. cetera. So in, in, in it already, this concept already exists uh, in various parts of India. So this is an uh, overview of Interporto Bologna, Italy. It's an ILMZ integrated logistics manufacturing zone. You can see in the picture a lot of factories around and then there is a logistics terminal uh, which is providing services. So in Machli Patnam area in 1000 acres, something like this Kampur is developing. Even the US has uh, this kind of facility. So I'm seeing this building, unless you see, you can't uh, you can't translate it into practice. So in Chicago, you can see the uh, intermodal facility. Now coming to the charges, how charging is done? Unlike railway, here the rates are charged per TU or FU on the basis of distance lab, weight, lower deck, or upper deck. Empty container and empty flat wagons are charged at different rates as per rates. As far as uh, a movement of uh, uh, containers as concerned, it is the rate circular received by railway board and then we charge cost plus fixes. So what is the basis of rating? First of course is what is the cost that I will incur. Second is what competition is charging. 
Third is what kind of value and services I'm providing. I will charge some extra. If there is uh, a skimming required, I will do that. And uh, if I need to be penetrative, uh, where uh, I have uh, uh, a monopolistic uh, market, I can do that. So the destination based types of tariffs on the basis of loading by empty container. So between ports and terminals, there could be a tariff. Between terminals, there is a different tariff. Between private siding and container rail terminals and ports, there is a different tariff. This flexibility gives us a lot of leeway uh, to negotiate with the customers. So for general containers, there will be a different tariff. Refer containers are much more expensive. We charge almost 1.5 times more than general containers. Upper deck, we charge less. In hub and spoke, again, we charge little more because uh, hub and spoke is nothing but in railway parlance, you can say two point destinations, plug in two points. Then we also believe in composite tariffs. That if, if a trade says that, sir, I do not want to break up of so many things, you tell me from Navashiva port, you will bring it to Sonipat and you will do uh, first mile, last mile, warehousing, valuation, everything. What is the final tariff that you charge? So we do this also, composite tariff. Ludhiana terminal is uh, one of the best examples of composite tariffs because there's a lot of competition. So rail freight, handling, transportation, all combined for stream, commodity-wise, category-wise, we devise the tariff. Hazardous cargo, we charge uh, 1.5 times, uh, 1.9 times more, so almost 20% more than the general tariff. ODC containers, 20% more than the general container freight tariff. Tank containers, 20% more than general container freight tariff. Because these are expensive. So this is the slab that we made, 20 feet container, 40 feet container, and then you can see that up to 10. And these slabs are decided by railway board uh, uh, on our demand. So you can see the slabs, and then the weight slabs are fixed according to rail haulage payable to Indian Railway. This is a, how you calculate. So there is a haulage rate per TU uh, given by uh, railway board. Uh, and there is a distance slab. So one question might arise in your mind that if, if tariff is decided by a railway, then how do you earn profit? As I said, it is a concept called cost plus. I will add some margin over it and charge to my trade. Every terminal port has separate ports that you all know. How to find the route, uh, I mean the distance so between one terminal to another, you just click on this and you get the uh, and the rational. So this is just an example of say from Tuglakaba to Dadri with uh, if I want to see the distances, this is what is the table, cumulative and interdistance, and what is the carrying capacity, what is the gauge type. So when my staff designs the rating, they all consider these factors. Rail haulage is as per distance and weight slab that we just discovered. We also charge 5% developmental subcharge because on the development of ICTs, you uh, uh, invest a lot of money. It's a highly capital intensive project. Uh, a 300 acre uh, multimodal logistic park will require some 420, 430 crores. Then uh, on IR haulage, uh, Railway has given right now 5% discount. So we also pass it on to our customer. For upper deck movement, there is a 50% discount uh, as compared to lower deck. Uh, hub and spoke, we try, we give telescopic rate advantage if, if railway board extends the same to us. Then there is something called TAC, terminal access charge. On uh, the railway good shed, which is declared as container rail terminal, railway charges TAC, and we charge the same from our customer. So, for example, 1.6 lakh uh, per week for inward and similarly for outward. So railway today earns CRT charges also, and so do we. Uh, on our tariff, we uh, multiply it with overhead charge of 1.9 per kilometer of loaded and 1.19 per kilometer for empty. Railway charges are uh, from Kanko break one charges uh, of 67 rupees for 20 feet container, 121 rupees for 40 feet container. We just charge the same from our customer. Then terminal cost of movement of reefer container. As I told you, reefer containers require 
or if you if you travel by Rajdhani or Shatabdi, you find end-to-end -end generators on each side to, for power supply. Same thing is done for different containers. So we charge uh, for the power pack also. That is nothing but a generator. But then we provide a lot of volume discount schemes. So we have some cost of VDS uh, and uh, cost of empty movement because railway charges, uh, even if I run an underframe, I have to pay freight today. So similarly, that is uh, transferred to the customers. Yeah. So we charge 5% developmental surcharge because we uh, invest a lot of money on the development of terminals. And so 5% development surcharge we take. But today, railway provides me 5% discount on rail footage. So we transfer the same to our customer. Uh, for upper deck movement, we charge 50% lower than the lower deck movement. In hub and spoke movement, we, we charge telescopic, we give telescopic rate advantage because railway also gives me the same advantage, even for two point rates, that is nothing but hub and spoke. As far as terminal access charge is concerned, it is nothing but uh, allowing a rate on a container rail terminal. Any good shed which is uh, notified as CRT, railway charges TAC, so we also charge from the customers. Uh, it is TAC generally in the range of 1.2 lakh to 1.8 lakh per rate. Uh, each way, inward and outward. So we also charge some things. Now overhead. Overhead is uh, uh, almost 1.9 per kilometer for loaded and 1.19 uh, for empty. This we charge per TU basis from our customer. Railway charges, recline charges. Uh, so uh, we do the same to our customer. And uh, as far as the reefer container is concerned, as I told you that it's an uh, expensive uh, container. Uh, so we charge uh, uh, for power packs that uh, provides uh, supply and even freight is almost 1.5 times higher than the normal container freight. But at the same time, we have a flexibility to provide a lot of VDS, volume discount scheme. Although we inbuilt uh, uh, the cost uh, in the rating, but uh, VDS is on the basis of volume. So any, any customer, say Musk shipping line, if, if you provide 5,000 containers to me per annum, I'll give you, say, 20% discount. So this is a scheme which is very, very popular. Cost of empty wagon movement because railway charges from us, so we have to charge from the customer. Considering everything above, a margin is proposed. If the margin could be as low as 5%, it could be as high as 20%. So these are the factors which, uh, whenever rating is done, mm -hmm. what is the volume that is offered by the party, what is the competitive market rate by rail, and what is the comparative road tariff. If there is an exclusive agreement, say from Hindustan Zinc Limited, there is an exclusive agreement. So I'll provide a, a much lower rate to Ezreal because it will be an annual volume of say 10,000 containers, 15,000 containers. So it, it also depends. Then empty container repositioning is nothing but any party wanting containers at the terminal where empty containers are not available, then we charge. And there are many terminals where we provide composite tariff rather than giving breakup of uh, separately of rail freight, handling, transportation, etc. We charge a composite rate as I gave example of Lithiana term. This is a rate circular issued by Concord. You can see that from Balak uh, store to uh, Kolkata. Uh, that is called CTKR. So in different slab categories, then there is a approved tariff, which is a public tariff. Similarly, for example, you can see from DRT, that is in Mumbai, Dronagiri, Dino to Mayar Airport Terminal, this is a tariff for 20 feet and 40 feet. <clears throat> and this is just a freight tariff. The handling, transportation, port related charges will be in addition to the freight. So, one should be careful because there are many times uh, the, the faulty proposals are received from terminals or uh, the areas. It could be a last minute proposal, hurriedly made, half baked proposal, or there is no operational feasibility. Even if a rate is given operationally, it won't be possible to carry. Then uh, you know, with, there is no proper justification for a reduction in tariff sought by the terminal or no projection of volume and growth is given, so therefore you cannot appreciate how much reduction should be given. Or there is no projection of earning and profit margins provided by terminals. 
or there is no cost benefit analysis done uh, in case of extension extension of uh, any tariff uh, new analysis has been done so these are some of the issues that uh, uh, are generally faced but then uh, almost the, the method is streamlined but yes one has to be careful that look at these factors that I have just uh, mentioned uh, are taken into consideration while doing a rating so it's a, it's a very very uh, important thing uh, I'll just touch upon the dynamic portion, although uh, dynamic pricing is nothing but you can say it could be in various ways. One is that uh, uh, seasonal uh, tariff given. So quarter one, there is a different tariff, quarter two, there is a different tariff, quarter three and quarter four are the busiest quarters, so there is a different tariff. From an unimportant uh, terminal, there could be a different tariff. For initiation of a business, there could be a different tariff. So there has to be a flexibility. Uh, so we generally maintain uh, a window of uh, uh, six months to you know, one year for tariff. It is not in perpetuity. But if we feel that yes, market can uh, all of a sudden fuel prices have increased, we immediately revise the tariff, and the customers know that. Uh, that uh, uh, and we mention the validity of the tariff. That yes, these tariffs are valid for two months. After which it may be reviewed again. So that is the kind of flexibility and dynamism that can for you. What is the challenge for logistics today? Uh, so I will say that these four things summarize almost everything in this uh, logistics sector. One is the very high logistics cost. So uh, as I said that in India, it's almost 14% uh, of the total cost. We have to reduce it to 78%. Then underdeveloped material handling infrastructure. Any, any railway officer will appreciate this. If you see and the good shit that a railway maintains, and if you see the terminal that Concora or any private uh, party maintains, you can understand that yes, and still uh, this uh, material handling infrastructure has to be very robust. Then only customers will get the confidence to come to your town. Warehousing is one sector which post GST is integrating now, but still in, in our country it is a fragmented warehousing. Container Corporation at present has 3.5 million square feet of warehousing. And in the next four years, uh, we uh, are developing it to 15 million square feet of warehousing. That is the kind of demand of warehousing. In fact, uh, in Delhi NCR area, uh, Amazon, Flipkart, and many other agencies have, have rented out almost all the warehouses. This is the kind of demand in the consumption center. So this is another a big business vertical that Concor is uh, uh, looking for its future business. In fact, Concord will be giving tough competition to central warehousing population because CWC warehouses like FCI warehouses are highly dilapidated and uh, old. And then lack of seamless movement of goods across modes. And that is our job uh, as a multimodal transporter. The customer should be worry free if they hand it over to me at a, either a seaport or a dry port. Through whichever mode it moves, I have to ensure that it moves seamlessly. So uh, I think here I will stop because uh, uh, the kind of uh, input that I wanted to give for an overall holistic understanding, uh, I think uh, that was the, the, the input that we required. Concord is today uh, amongst the Fortune 500 companies. Uh, it is your company, Indian Railways uh, PSU, uh, and uh, an Aratna PSU, which uh, aspires and dreams to become a Maharatna. KYCL. In banks, uh, you see, they ask for your KYC. You know your customer. We call it KYCL. So know your container location. The first concept is called continuous cargo visibility. Today, when you order something from Amazon, a dress, or a flower vase, or any item, or your laptop, or an iPad, it just immediately, or a cake, you immediately start getting messages, sir, your transshipment has left, it will arrive in 72 hours, it is likely to arrive by this, the boy has reached your doorstep, etc., etc. What we are doing in containers is the same thing. The moment container arrives at a terminal, by using radio data terminals, which you can see in the picture, we immediately feed it. It is uh, uh, located, uh, it is connected online to all the terminals. 
So any and to uh, there is a mobile app which is given to all the customers. So they they can check their container location either through website query or through kiosk or using mobile concora or a service. This is how the touch screens at every terminal they provide every information. This is uh, the screenshot of ICD to the cover. This is a mobile app. It provides container number, train number, originating station, destination station, departure date, wagon number, last reported station. The entire data is integrated with customs through EDI, electronic data interchange. Anything that I see, uh, immediately customs get that information and uh, their people will immediately process it for the custom examination. Today, our customers get online delivery orders, online examination job order, online loading job order, online invoices, receipts, e-sealing, and online generation of pre-deposit account statements. This is, again, uh, uh, a new step. Even public grievance rate receipt for all customers uh, is through uh, online facilitation. So this, of course, uh, uh, you know, I did not want to cover and cover in much greater detail, otherwise what the, these are the things that we do. So, so, a company, an Indian railway company, one should be proud, with a multimodal licensing service provider, environment friendly rail mode, presence or across all major ports, air cargo, and reducing carbon footprint uh, every year. This began its operation, as I told you, that the T8 first container was taken, but from seven ICDs taken from Delhi, it started its operations. Today, it is a network of 64 terminals. These are the state-wise breakup. Lot of MPs and ministers keep demanding to open container terminal in their states. So 10 more container terminals are, are already under commissioning, multimodal logistic parks. Uh, well, I think I'll end up here because uh, all these things I have already covered in that. If you see the figures, then uh, 1920 due to last quarter of pandemic, uh, there was a dip. But I'm happy to inform you that in 2021, last five months, April to August, we have done the best ever throughput and best ever earnings. And this year, the 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 turnover of Concord is going to touch 8,000 groups. Can any one of you guess what will be the profit of Concord uh, every year uh, with a turnover of 7,200 crores? What will be the profit? 1,350 people. It's the lean and thin, lean, one of the leanest organizations, most efficient profit-making organization of India. 1,300 people giving a profit of 1,200 crores with a turnover of 7,200 crore. It's an Indian government company. And we are the market leaders. There are multinational corporations working in container field today in India, like DP World, uh, Adani, uh, Port of Singapore, Gateway Logistics, Hind Terminals, and so many. So, because it, it works under different corporate cultures. 